It was the war that made modern America. From 1846 to 1848, the US engaged in a brutal, bitter struggle with its southern neighbor, a struggle that would expand American territory by over half a million square miles. It's thanks to this war that California, New Mexico, Utah, Arizona, Nevada, and western Colorado are today part of the US. That the issue of Texas's southern boundary was settled firmly in Washington's favor. Yet for all its strategic successes, there was a dark side to the Mexican-American War, one that made it hard to celebrate even in that gung-ho era. As America's first war of aggression, the war forced the rising superpower to look itself in the mirror for the first time. Launched for spurious reasons and resulting in Mexico losing over half its territory, it was declared by Ulysses S. Grant one of the most unjust ever waged by a stronger against a weaker nation and vigorously opposed by a young Abraham Lincoln. Today we're delving into one of the most important conflicts in North American history, the war that kick-started the military careers of both Grant and Robert E. Lee and changed the destiny of those two nations forever. Although things kicked off in 1846, the tortured road leading to the outbreak of the Mexican-American War began decades earlier. Well, really, it was less one tortured road and more a tangled mess of dangerous on-ramps all twisting and turning before finally crashing together in a geopolitical multi-car pileup. And it's our job to try and untangle this spaghetti junction of cause and effect so it all makes sense for you. Lucky us. So let's start with the major on-road marked Mexican independence. Back in 1821, the Spanish Viceroyalty of New Spain finally won independence after a decade of fighting, declaring itself the nation of Mexico. Young Mexico was incomprehensibly vast, a behemoth that included not just what we today call Central America, but swaths of sparsely populated land that stretched all the way up to the modern California-Oregon border. And that was a problem, because independent Mexico simply didn't have the resources to control that much territory. The independence war had been a human catastrophe. Perhaps half a million people died from a pre-war population of around 6.5 million. The economy had been devastated. On top of that, Spain had left the country's silver mines vital to any economic comeback in ruins. From this general chaos was bred political chaos. Between independence and 1855, the Mexican presidency would change hands 50 times. It was these issues that led to one of independent Mexico's earliest disasters, the Texas Revolution. Since we'll probably cover it in depth in the future, we're not going to go too deep into Texas independence here. The short version is that unable to control their sparsely populated northern territory, Mexico invited Americans to settle it. But when the dictator Santorana tried to force Mexico's states into a highly centralized system, the Texans were all like, ah oh, yeah, no, plus we'd like to write our own rules, plus We'd like to keep our slaves. Hmm? The loss of Texas contributed to the impression that Mexico couldn't control its frontier, an impression further reinforced by the state's inability to stop native tribes conducting raids on remote towns. But the bigger issue was that it opened a whole can of worms regarding the Mexican-Texan border. Throughout Spanish rule, the boundary between the state of Teas and the rest of the country had been set at the Nueces River. However, when the Texans forced Santorana to sign a treaty at gunpoint, a clause was included that opened the future possibility of extending their border to the Rio Grande. This effectively created a disputed zone between Mexico and the Republic of Texas, one which saw repeated incursions and atrocities over the following decade. Importantly, though, while both sides committed awful acts, it was the Mexican war crimes that got reported in the USA. This included stuff like the Lottery of Death, when 170-odd Texan prisoners were forced to draw from a jar filled with white and black beans at a 10 to 1 ratio. Those who drew black were summarily executed. As the 1840s dawned then, Mexico was in a constant state of internal upheaval, unable to control its border regions, facing demographic crises in the north, and constantly vilified in the press. All this chaos would not go unnoticed. Yes, it's time we leapt over to the next major on-ramp in this coming disaster, the one marked America. Back in 1803, the United States cut a deal with Napoleon Bonaparte to buy French Louisiana for $15 million, one of the greatest territorial expansions in U.S. history. In fact, it was so great that it scared the shit out of Spain, which rushed to get the U.S. to sign the Adams-Honest Treaty, setting their mutual border in West Louisiana. 
Pointedly, this placed Texas firmly within New Spain, a claim that would be grandfathered to Mexico after independence. But by the time Texas split from the Mexican party, America's policy of peacefully buying land had been replaced by a new screed, Manifest Destiny. A potent mix of religion and imperial expansionism, Manifest Destiny taught that it was God's literal will for America to expand ever west till it stretched from sea to shining sea. The trouble was, the West Coast already had owners. In the North, Oregon Territory was jointly administered with Great Britain, while Alta California was part of Mexico. While some people did advocate war with Britain over Oregon Territory, the thought of a bunch of limeys marching down to burn DC for the second time made the idea a non-starter. The same couldn't be said for California. Toward the end of his second term in office, Andrew Jackson had captured public sentiment by suggesting Washington annex California. Since then, annexation had become a cornerstone of Manifest Destiny. Pro-U.S. Texans called for California to join their republic in being admitted to the USA. In 1842, American Thomas Catsby Jones even attacked the port of Monterey and raised the stars and stripes before being told to stand down. Yet the growing U.S. obsession with California wasn't solely the product of greed or some vague notion of religious duty. There was also real politic. Like Texas, California was sparsely populated, with white settlers beginning to outnumber the Mexicans. And like Texas, California was also the center of some great power shenanigans. Ever since Texas said adios to Mexico, both France and Great Britain had been circling it like hungry sharks, offering protection against its former owner in exchange for an alliance. Remember, at this stage, the special relationship between the US and the UK was less younger and older sibling and more escaped to Dalmatian and Cruella de Vil. What? We're, we're, we're not, not s selling the, the puppies. A Texas loyal to the UK could be used as a staging ground for an invasion, allowing Britain to immediately open up two fronts in any future war. With the dispute over Oregon Territory heating up, it was likewise feared that the British might preemptively seize California. These were the political fears that lay at the heart of the drive west, the private face of Manifest Destiny's religious mask. Washington needed to secure Texas and California for security reasons, but it couldn't do so without sparking a war with Mexico. For years, this was the contradiction at the heart of U.S. foreign policy, the burning need to expand, tempered by the desire not to wage an imperialist war. And that all changed in 1844. That November, underdog candidate James K. Polk squeaked a win in the presidential election, running on a platform that embraced Manifest Destiny. Before his first year in office was up, Polk had signed off on Texas annexation. The Lone Star State was admitted on December 29, 1845. To return one last time to our rather tortured metaphor, this is the moment when all of those coiling roads finally came crashing together. With annexation, Polk had taken war with Mexico from a possibility to something inevitable. Perhaps one of the most cynical aspects of the run-up to the Mexican-American War is just how hard Polk worked to provoke conflict. Despite warnings, Mexico ultimately didn't attack when Texas was annexed. So the 11th president turned up the heat even higher. In December of 1845, Polk made a speech to Congress declaring Texas annexation would increase the U.S. border to the Rio Grande. As you'll recall from chapter one of today's video, this was hella provocative. Polk was effectively laying claim to the disputed zone, despite 1845 ending with still no major Texan settlements in the area. Still, Polk declared that he was acting in good faith. That same winter, he dispatched former Congressman John Sliddle to discuss Texas annexation with the Mexican government. Or so the Mexicans were led to believe. In reality, Sliddle came with orders to not just settle the disputed zone boundary, but also offer to buy California and New Mexico. Insulted, the Mexicans refused to meet him. Up north, the story was wrapped up with other, admittedly true, reports on Mexico not honoring its debts to U.S. citizens to create a narrative of perfidious foreigners trampling all over America's olive branch. To which we can only say, come on, seriously? Of course Mexico was outraged by Siddle's offer, just as America would have been outraged if the British had been like all, hey, let's meet up and discuss the Oregon Territory. Uh, <laughs> only kidding. Sell us Ohio or we will invade you, yes? 
Back in Washington, though, the media narrative stuck. It stuck so hard that Polk began preparing to ask Congress for a declaration of war based solely on Mexican insults to Siddle's honor. Thankfully for Polk, though, he wouldn't have to go down in history as the guy who attacked a nation for refusing a meeting, because fate was about to dump the perfect rationale for war right into his lap. While Siddle was in Mexico, Polk had ordered General Zachary Taylor and 2,400 men into Texas. In March 1846, they had entered the disputed zone. The stated reason was to protect a revenue officer Congress had sent to administer the zone. But Ulysses S. Grant, then a lieutenant in Taylor's army, had a blunter assessment. We were sent to provoke a fight, but it was essential that Mexico should commence it. It would soon turn out that provoking fights was something Taylor's army excelled at. Once inside the zone, Taylor began doing everything in his power to piss off the Mexicans. He constructed fortifications, blockaded the mouth of the Rio Grande acts that were, in a region claimed by Mexico, tantamount to war. Finally, in late April, Taylor got the reaction that he wanted. Around sundown on April 25, 1846, 70 American dragoons under Captain Seth Thornton were ambushed by Mexican cavalry. In the subsequent battle, 16 were killed. When he heard the news, Taylor sent a simple note to the president. It read, Hostilities may now be considered to have commenced. For Polk, this message was a gift from heaven. At the last minute, he was able to change his speech from, Yo, Mexico, you diss my boy Slidell. Two, and this one is actually a real quote, American blood has been shed on American soil. Strictly speaking, it wasn't true, but strictly speaking, Congress did not give a f on May the 13th, 1846, the U.S. formally declared war on another nation for only the second time in its history after 1812. While the Whig Party protested, not least a young Illinois lawmaker by the name of Abraham Lincoln, events had already taken on a life of their own. Down south, the intentionally provoked war was already well underway. By the time it ended, both U.S. and Mexican history would have changed forever. It was early morning on May the 8th, 1846, when General Mariano Arista and his 3,200 men fanned out across Palo Alto and took up positions. A vast empty field, Palo Alto had little significance as the dawn slowly broke that long ago day. Little significance, but the single road slicing through its western extremity, leading in the direction of Fort Texas. The same fort Zachary Taylor's force was now heading for in the hopes of breaking a Mexican siege. In the morning light, General Arista spread his men along a mile-long line, cannons focused near the road, cavalry on the flanks. Then he sat back and waited. Around noon, a distant commotion signaled the arrival of Taylor's army. The two sides faced each other across the empty prairie grass. And so began the first engagement of the Mexican-American War. At the beginning of the Battle of Palo Alto, General Arista could have been confident of victory. Mexican cavalry was among the best in the world, and his troops had the numerical advantage. It was only when Taylor's army rolled forward their 18-pound cannons that it became clear how one-sided the fighting would be. American artillery was simply in another class. While Mexican cannonballs frequently fell short of their targets, American volleys made mincemeat of enemy lines. By 7 p.m., General Arista was in retreat, over 200 of his men already killed or wounded. As Taylor's force made camp, the Mexicans fell back to a dry riverbed known as Resaca de la Palma. Filled with scrub, it offered few clear methods of attack except hand-to-hand -hand combat. Clear of American heavy guns, Arista hoped to neutralize Taylor's advantage. Sadly, the second day of fighting wouldn't go any better for Mexico. The Battle of Resaca de la Palma began at 3 p.m. when Taylor ordered his men into the dry riverbed to fight, just as General Arista had planned. But Arista hadn't planned for his own side's morale to have been devastated the day before, or for the Americans to be skilled in close quarters combat. After 60 minutes fierce fighting, the Americans broke through. As they poured into the clearing, a U.S. cavalry charge hit Mexico's heavy guns. On the verge of losing everything, Arista had no choice but to sound a retreat across the Rio Grande. It was a devastating escape as the rushing waters carrying off another 160 men atop the 386 Arista had been forced to leave behind on the battlefield. The twin U.S. victories set the tone for the rest of the war, one in which Mexico would lose just about every major engagement. But while we might take Mexico's loss for granted today, there was really nothing inevitable about it. Mexico's forces were battle-hardened from decades of fighting, and they consistently held the numerical advantage. On the other side, U.S. death rates could be huge. Of the 104,556 who fought, 13,780 American soldiers would die, still the highest mortality ratio in U.S. Army history. 
No, what doomed Mexico wasn't some inherent weakness or even its outdated technology. But chaos. In the six months following the Battle of Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma, two separate revolutions would topple the government. Combined with early, demoralizing losses, the confusion in the capital was the kiss of death. And those early losses could be really demoralizing. A few weeks after Taylor routed General Arista's men, a small force under John Charles Fremont invaded Alta California. Dispatched by Polk months beforehand in the guise of a survey expedition, they'd lain low on the border until word came of the April ambush that kicked off the war. Now they rode across California, rallying white settlers to their cause. By the time they reached Sonoma, their army was large enough that the garrison under Colonel Mariana Vallejo decided there was no point fighting and instead surrendered the territory. While the native Californians would engage in sporadic fighting against the invaders, the deal was done the moment Vallejo signed the paper. By January 1847, following some minor skirmishes, California would be firmly in Uncle Sam's pocket alongside Texas. And that left the white-whiskered codger with only one more war goal, the humiliation of Mexico. As the war consumed California, Zachary Taylor took advantage of his early victories to plunge headlong into Mexican territory. By mid-September, his army had reached Monterey, a city so well fortified that it was known as a perfect Gibraltar after the famously hard-to-conquer British possession. If one thing characterized Taylor in the Mexican-American War, though, it was an ability to beat even the longest odds. Realizing the city's defenses were far too far apart to mutually support one another, old Rough and Ready hatched a plan to engage in vicious urban and warfare in the streets themselves. It would be both the right decision from a macro point of view and a catastrophe up close. Beginning on September 20, 1846, the Battle of Monterey saw some of America's heaviest casualties of the conflict. Street by street fighting mowed down dozens of West Point graduates sent to support Taylor. By the end, over 500 U.S. soldiers would be out of the fight for good, dead, wounded, or missing. But Monterey also saw flashes of genius, like when Taylor's men began smashing holes in the walls of adjoining buildings so they could advance without having to enter the streets. By September 24th, the defenders had been pushed back to the town square. Generously, Taylor allowed the surrendering Mexicans to leave unharmed, something that earned him Polk's undying enmity. Still, Taylor got the job done. Monterey occupied, he went and took Saltillo, establishing a tight U.S. foothold in Mexico's north. It was near this last town that Taylor would win his greatest battle of all. While these set-piece battles unfolded, Mexico was suffering yet another of its damaging political upheavals. Back in July of 1846, the exiled dictator Santa Ana had opened lines of communication with Washington, suggesting it end the war on favorable terms if the Americans helped him regain power. Polk authorized him to pass through the naval blockade and into Mexico, only for Santa Ana to immediately double-cross him, raise an army, and march north to fight the Yanks. It was this 20,000-strong army that Taylor learned in February 1847 was now bearing down on his his forces, hungry for blood. By this stage, Taylor had been reduced to just 4,500 men, his best units reassigned by a Polk wary of Taylor's growing popularity back home. Although he hunkered down at a defendable ranch outside Saltillo known as Buena Vista, things were so one-sided that Santa Ana expected an easy win. But the golden rule of military history is never underestimate your opponent. Santa Ana had the numbers on his side. He even had artillery, thanks to a group of Catholic U.S. Army deserters known as St. Patrick's Battalion. But it also just led his men on the hardest march of their lives. People were sick, weak. Santa Ana had been so keen to make battle that it left his supply lines back in the countryside. His forces had and eaten for 36 hours. When the two sides finally met then, on February 23, 1847, they were both suffering obvious disadvantages. In the end, it would turn out that the Mexican disadvantage was greater. The Battle of Buena Vista kicked off with a dual attack by Santa Rana along the main road and from the ridge overlooking the ranch. The sheer numbers advantage almost handed the battle to Mexico. By noon, Taylor's lines were in danger of collapse but they held just long enough to be reinforced. Combined with the still superior U.S. artillery, the Americans were able to hold their ground. As night fell, Taylor expected the fighting to continue the next day, but the Battle of Buena Vista was already over. Aware his men were too tired and hungry to return to the field, Santa Ana retreated in the night, ending the northern phase of the war. Although both sides claimed victory, the casualties were enormous. 673 Americans killed or wounded, with hundreds more deserting, versus around 1,800 of the Mexican forces lost. Yet for Santa Ana, this would turn out to be a high point. As he now raced south, the Americans were on the verge of opening up a whole new front in the war, one that would lead to one of the most storied campaigns in military history, the March on Mexico City.
In March of 1847, Major General Winfield Scott was dispatched to Veracruz with one straightforward task – to capture Mexico City. But straightforward doesn't necessarily mean simple. Ahead of Scott lay over 200 miles of dangerous terrain. There were Mexican regulars to contend with, plus vaqueros, bandit gangs that also doubled as guerrilla fighters. Many thought it couldn't be done, that Scott would stretch his supply line so thin his army would collapse. To which Scott basically responded, Wanna bet? Whatever your overall thoughts on the war, it's hard to deny that Scott's campaign was spectacular. Following the route Hernan Cortes took to conquer the Aztec Empire, Scott blazed a trail across Mexico that would not just inspire Americans, but be called by Britain's Duke of Wellington unsurpassed in military annals. The campaign started as spectacularly as you'd expect, with what was then the largest amphibious landing in military history at Veracruz. While shelling of the city killed innumerable civilians, once the port was secure, Scott was gracious, treating Veracruz leniently. After all, he had bigger fish to fry. The first great fry-up was the Battle of Cerro Gordo on April the 18th. On the Plan de Rio, Scott's 8,500-strong force managed to dislodge Santa Ana's larger army from a pass, thanks to a flanking maneuver executed by future Confederate General Robert E. Lee. Yet it wasn't just the battles that cemented Scott's reputation, but the risks he took. In late August, the Major General found himself so deep in Mexican territory that he couldn't defend his supply lines. This was war for dummies level stuff, something Scott himself had warned against in training manuals that he had written. Once in the field, though, Scott took the ballsy decision to cut his lines and press on to the capital, living off the land. It should have been suicide, but a wild gamble paying off is often the difference between a military disaster and a great victory. Just ask Napoleon. In Scott's case, that gamble paid dividends. On August the 19th, the Battle of Contreras left Mexico City wide open, saved the fortified castle of Chapultepec, guarded by a thousand Mexican cadets. Nearly a month later, on September the 12th, Scott's forces finally attacked it. It was the last great set piece of the war. The fall of Chapultepec remains a rich symbol in Mexican history. It was here that the teenage Niños heroes refused a retreat order and fought to the death, the last of them leaping from the castle wrapped in Mexico's flag so that Americans would capture it. It was here, too, that St. Patrick's Battalion was smashed, 30 of its members mass-executed at the exact moment the U.S. flag rose above the castle. When the dust settled on September 14th, the war was effectively over. While Santa Ana would harry U.S. forces with guerrilla tactics for another month, the fall of Chapultepec was the war's last hurrah. Now, all that remained was to settle the peace. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo took an age to get signed. After Santa Ana was deposed again, poor, war-shattered Mexico couldn't form a government for months. Up in the States, Polk got so frustrated that he recalled his envoy, Nicholas Trist, but Trist ignored the order, instead staying to sign one of America's most consequential treaties. Under the terms, Mexico lost over half of its territory, ceding to the U.S. not just modern-day Texas and California, but also lands that now includes Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, and parts of Colorado. In the blink of an eye, America grew by 500,000 square miles. Manifest destiny had been fulfilled. But at what cost? The war marked the first time the U.S. expanded, not with treaties or purchases, but with an imperialist war aimed at carving up a neighbor. Mexico, already unstable, now entered a near-death spiral as successive governments collapsed. This would leave it open to everything from the return of Santa Ana's dictatorship to the rise of Benito Juarez, the Reform War, and ultimately, French invasion. Nor would the U.S. be spared the consequences. Although Polk left office in triumph, replaced by war hero Zachary Taylor, his radical expansion of the U.S. had upset the delicate balance between slave and free states. Before the war was even complete, the Wilmot Proviso attempted to outlaw slavery in the new territories, sparking a bitter clash between pro- and anti-slavery factions. It would take another decade and spare change, but eventually this ill feeling would pave the way for the Civil War. This was a war that would see so many U.S. veterans of the Mexican War turned against one another. With hindsight, then, we can see that the Mexican-American War remains one of the most significant conflicts fought on the entire continent. Not only did it reshape both nations, giving them boundaries we mostly still recognize today, but it provided the fuel for coming periods of twin trauma. It may not have the same pull factor as the Civil War or World War II or even Vietnam. But as this video has hopefully shown, the Mexican-American War deserves a vital place in not just military history, but the history of the Americas. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.